بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم ما بعد أيها الأحباب in the treaties rift in Ahl Sunnah bil Ahl Sunnah we've reached the uh, I believe it's the sixth uh, lesson and Shaykhna Alama al Muhaddith Abdul Masin al Abbad Hafid Allah Taala he said, and he was discussing about criticizing individuals from Ahl Sunnah in order to destroy their reputation, and that it's better to keep some light if it's a person from Ahl Sunnah, and they even if they have some imperfections, they have some mistakes and some shortcomings, it's better to have them perhaps in that locality as a form of dim light rather than to extinguish that light and destroy so then in a whole locality you don't have the nur of Ahl Sunnah at all. Then maybe the Ashadis take over, the Sufis take over, the Takfiris take over, and other Jama'at and Wasets uh, take over. Wouldn't it be better to have someone from Ahl Sunnah even if they have shortcomings and work on correcting them and work on calling them back to the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam if they've gotten far and if, even if they're just some mistakes just to correct them in their mistakes. Help them with their mistakes. And because you... Uh, as corrected someone one time doesn't mean you, you hands free. I, I, hey, I did my job. He's on the law. Subhanallah. This is a really big mistake that we have amongst the individ, uh, amongst the people, and especially the lay person. That we have this enough from the duaat, but we have this also from the lay people that we have individuals. He say, you know, Ahi, I told him, I warned him. You spoke to him one time. You didn't even have the uh, dalil yourself or even the knowledge or the ability to really understand the issue, possibly yourself, but you warned him, Jazallah khair. And then now he's a mubtadi'ah, he's the bad, because he sat with so-and-so, he drank tea with so-and-so, or he uh, said, said something would sound like he praised so-and-so, or he asked a question, wa'iyadu billah, this is a big problem. Atlub al-ilm, atlub al-ilm, atlub al-ilm, seek knowledge. Seek knowledge, the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said, Whatever law wants good for a person, gives them understanding of the knowledge. The Prophet said, <coughs> That whoever traverses a path, the path of knowledge, uh, Allah will make easy for him the path of Jannah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us to be on Talib al -Ilm, to get back to the books, get back to sitting with the ulama and benefiting. May Allah forgive us our shortcomings. Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. The Shaykh then went on to say, if two or more lamps cannot be found, then one lamp is still better than total darkness. So he's making a likeness, a similitude, between uh, light of the lamp and the light of a, uh, of a dai, of a person who's in a place of darkness. He's the one who has some knowledge in that place. Maybe he's a talib al -ilm. Maybe he doesn't have much, but he has more than the other people. And he has enough to teach them. That, that, that perhaps could be a light, especially if it's a light of Ahl Sunnah. So wouldn't it be better to let that light carry on than to pour water on it and destroy it or kick it over? Then the Shaykh said, May Allah have mercy upon our Shaykh Abdul Aziz bin Baz who dedicated his life to Islamic knowledge, learning it, acting upon it, teaching and propagating it. He was concerned with helping uh, he was concerned with helping and encouraging the other scholars and students of knowledge to teach and propagate. This is what Ibn Baz was upon. I myself heard the Sheikh once advise another scholar to dedicate himself to propagating it. However, the scholar excused himself, which Sheikh uh, uh, Ibn Baz did not accept. So the Sheikh, may Allah have mercy upon him, said to him, partial blindness is better than total blindness. Allahu Akbar, look at the hikmah. Meaning that if all of something cannot be achieved, then one should not leave trying to obtain some of it. So if strong eyesight is not found, partial eyesight is still better than total darkness. Our sheikh lost his eyesight when he was only 20 years old. However, Allah replaced this with insight for which he became known for amongst all people. This was Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Baz. Rahimahullah ta'ala. May Allah bless him with Jannah for those. Look at that. The basira of the sheikh and what can we take from that lesson? That, as the Shaykh was mentioning, it's better to have some khayr from Ahl Sunnah, someone who's Ahl Sunnah. Okay, we're talking about their usul. Even if they have some issues, they have some mistakes in that place, rather than distinguishing all the khayr and having nothing. 
Sheikh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah said, if clear, pure light is not found, this is Sheikh al-Islam, if, if pure, clear, pure light is not found, and nothing remains except light that contains some impurity, whereby if the people do not take from this unclear light, then they will be left in total darkness. It is not appropriate in this situation to neither blame the person nor forbid the people from light that contains some form of darkness. Unless one cannot find, unless one can find light not containing any darkness at all, how many people do we find who have strayed away from light that contains some form of darkness and ended up leaving alone the light in its entirety? Similar to the above is a saying of some people, truth is just one single entity and it cannot be divided. So either take all of it or leave, uh, leave off all of it. And this was in Mijmu'ah Fatal. So if somebody possesses some of the truth, he is to be advised to preserve that which he has and at the same time strive in attaining that which he is deficient of. Allahu Akbar. These are what these ulama, this is Shaykh Islam was saying, and here's what uh, Shaykh uh, Abdulaziz, uh, Shaykh uh, Abdul al Abad was saying. Isn't that enough with these great mountains of knowledge, with the, what they advise us with? Why is it we can't practice? Why do we still have the same questions, the same issues? Why are we still confused by the websites? The websites should not control our deen. We should be seeking knowledge. If the website, if you're downloading lectures, not lectures, what I mean is books, books that, are, that you're reading and books that you're studying. If there are students of knowledge coming from the website and they're giving you full lectures, he's teaching you Asul al-Thalatha, he's teaching you Umdat al-Hakam, he's teaching you Umdat al -Fet. you know, he's teaching you books and giving you the principles and the tools, then this you can benefit from. But if the website, you, you go to it and your heart feels dirty, you, you just, all you learned is about someone you never heard of and you listen to about six people refuting, or you read six people refuting, refuting and others patting them on the back, that they're on the same minhaj because they refuted him. They're all in agreement. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Every group is happy with itself. This is the case of Hizbiyyah. May Allah protect us from that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from that. Because it can happen. We can get so caught up in the being a group. But instead we should be a part of Ahl Sunnah. That we should be, yes, the group of Ahl Sunnah, but that we come together based on Kitab Allah wa Sunnah to Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we use that as the tools to, to make our judgments and the Fahim and the Salaf of this Ummah. That's what we should use. Those are the tools. The tools is not just because someone refuted someone that they're with us. And if they don't refute them, they're against us. This is a bad Qaida. It's become a Qaida. It's become a principle. And the ulama say so. It's not just me. It's from the ulama. I've read it. The ulama, they say this, that this becomes a Qaida. That some people are making principles. You're either with us or against us. Okay? You don't agree with me about this guy in America. And this one. He's from New York. And we said this about him. Well, I don't live in New York. I don't know anything about him. Well, you're not with us. You're against us. You know, all of this kind of this mentality. We've got to stop it. So, if one or two people benefit, well, alhamdulillah, and, uh, and, and begin to stop these practices and not participate in it, then may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them and bless us all with tawfiq. Ameen. The Shaykh then went on to say, Hafadhullah ta'ala, the praiseworthy and correct type of boycotting. So now the Shaykh has given us, this is from Allama uh, Abdul Masan al -Abad. He says, the praiseworthy. Actually, this is a statement from, yes, from the Shaykh. He said, the praiseworthy and correct type of boycott or boycotting is the one that contains benefit in it and is not that which causes harm. Allah Akbar. Again, we said this in many of our lectures. Mabni ala maslaha wa mafsada. That when we look at issues in the Sharia, when we're dealing with issues of ijtihad, issues of, you know, uh, where there involves trying to uh, make a judgment about someone and rulings like this, and it, and, it, and it requires a judgment from a scholar, because that's not revelation. If Sheikh so-and-so, no matter how much I love him, okay, if he makes a, a fatwa about so-and-so, that's not revelation from Allah Azza wa Jalla. It's not revelation. And with his fatwa and with his ijtihad, he has to have dalil, he has to have evidence. 
You can't just say, because this is the fitna that we fell into before with particular individuals who were considered uh, scholars, you know, some were, were scholars, but they were on hezbiya and misguidance, that the people blind followed them. So one particular scholar in Medina, he made all kind of fatwa, even things like saying things about India, that there's no scholars in India or, or something like this. What kind of, this is a kind of, this is absurd. And only when things got so out of hand, people followed him in that. How could you say that? How could you say there's no scholarship in India? India is full of scholarship. It's been known in the Hadith. Uh, in many countries, not just in the Arab world. The point being, having these general statements, these general hukum, and people blind followed these individuals. And they began to develop this mentality and make hajr and, and, and stay away from, from individual. There was no maslaha in that. There was no benefit in that. Not, not only that, it was mistaken. So we have to be careful. We have to watch this extremism. We have to practice. When you boycott, it should be for Allah Azza wa Jal. It should be for Allah Azza wa Jal. I have found very few people as a Muslim that I have boycotted. I boycotted very few, and the only ones that I did, they were takfiris. Because there was nothing, the, the adawa between us, the enmity between us, because of the fitna that they propagate and the fitna that they, they, they believe in and, and, and terrorism and, and extremism and speaking about the ulama and speaking about the Muslim governments and making takfir of this one, making those people, it's hard to, to have anything and, and we don't have much, uh, there's no common ground. It's very difficult even to give them dawah and they don't want to take dawah from you anyway. Perhaps they may take, make takfir of you or say you're murji or whatever. So it's very difficult. So, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when I see there's benefit, again, maslaha wa mafsada, I won't give those guys salams, or I will avoid them. Maybe I see them, and, and they see it on my face, and they will come up to me and greet me, though. They will try to break that code of silence. Those are the few times that I've, I've felt it necessary. But most of the, the people, it's not necessary. I don't see benefit. If I were to go, even some hizbis, I know. You know, we know many hizbis, you know. There's many... People in all kind of different Sufis, and I know some that are pretty extreme. There was no benefit. I saw no maslaha. If there's no maslaha in it, then leave it. If there's no benefit, you don't think this is going to affect this individual, they're going to come back, or it's not going to protect you in your religion, or some sort of akuba or something. If there's no maslaha, no benefit, and it's going to maybe even cause a greater harm, then it's not mishroor. If it's going to cause a greater harm, it's not mishroor. And this falls under other qawaid fiqiyah, other fiqh principles. Dar al mafasid, tukaddam al al by leaving the, the, uh, staying away from, from the harm takes precedence over, uh, over jilbal, uh, Al Manfa or Kamahakil. So protecting yourself from harm takes precedence over uh, over doing something which is uh, beneficial. But defending against the harm, against the evil, is has greater precedence. So we we take that precedence. The Sheikh went on to say, Have the law to Allah, and may Allah forgive me for getting off topic, and hopefully it's beneficial for, for those listening. He said, Sheikh Abdul Masin, uh, he said, The praiseworthy and correct uh, type of boycotting is the one that contains benefit in it and is not that which causes harm. Sheikh Al Islam said, If it was the case that every two, time two Muslims differed in a matter, they boycott each other. There will not remain any preservation or brotherhood between the Muslims. This is a mijmu of fatawa, showing us the importance. And you see this. We see this. Certain, certain communities, I'm amazed. I'm amazed how brothers hate each other. And how over something simple that a lot of times they don't even understand. These are common people. Brothers, they practice. Alhamdulillah, they pray. They listen to some translated durus, maybe. Usually just lectures, which is not enough to build your religion. That's another point I want to make, is just listening to a lecture. I listen to a thing, I listen to a khutbah. Those, that's beautiful. That helps your iman. 
but you don't build your deen off that. It's not where you get the principles and the kawaii. If you want to say you follow the salaf, you got to go into the books of the salaf. You got to go to those and benefit with the ulama and benefit from your students of knowledge who are teaching you that. You got to go and get those quiet and principles. That's what builds your religion. That brings you closer to Allah. But those other things, they just help your iman a little bit. And, you know, it's good. It's beneficial. But that's not how you build ilm. That's not ilm. So the Sheikh said, have the Allah Ta'ala. He also said, Sheikh Islam Ibn Taymiyyah also said, boycotting differs according to those who boycott. It depends on their strength and weakness. This is what Sheikh Islam said. Whether they are the minority or majority. The objective behind boycotting is to rebuke the one who is being boycotted and to discipline him, as well as deterring the other common Muslims from falling into the same mistakes. Look at this. He's giving you the maqasid. This is the maqasid of boycotting, the maqasid of hajr, the, the, the point of hajr. The, he's saying the objective behind boycotting is to rebuke the one who's being boycotted and to discipline him. It's a form of discipline. It's not arrogance and it's not to make yourself cool and your group and, and this and that and the other, but it's to rebuke him and it's to deter other Muslims from falling into the same mistakes. If the advantage and benefit of boycotting therefore outweighs the harm that will result from it, whereby the evil will be decreased, weakened, and concealed, then this situation boycotting is legislated. So meaning if boycotting has a good effect that it's going to decrease evil and weaken it and, and, and cover it up, then this is good, it's legislated. Uh, boycotting others is not uh, carried out, however, if the one being boycotted or other than him will not be deterred from this action. Rather, the evil will only increase or the one boycotting is in a position of weakness and therefore the harms of boycotting will be more than the benefit. Again, I said, masla wa mafsada. So if it's going to be har more harmful, avoid it. Maybe it's going to it's going to cause the community to split more. So, for example, you refute this masjid in Philly, you refute this masjid in New Jersey, and this one in L.A., and this one in this, and it only causes from the few Salafi masajid that are in that area, or the few uh, communities of Ahl Sunnah, it causes them to split one split with one another over one issue. These ones support this Sheikh in Yemen, these ones support this Sheikh in, 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 in Medina. And this one said this, and da 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 da, and you didn't praise our Sheikh, we don't like you. We, don't, we make Hajjah. What is this? What is this? You've only weakened the Dawah. The common people are confused. The other people who are not Salafi and not on the Sunnah definitely don't want any part to do with, with the Dawah to Salafi, a Dawah to Ahl Sunnah, because they see that the Salafis are only fighting each other, backbiting each other, cursing each other, even maybe fist fighting each other. It gets to that level. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us and guide us. Ameen, ya Rabbil Alameen. So Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he said, Boycotting others is not carried out. However, if the one being boycotted or other than him will not be deterred from this action, rather the evil will only increase. Or the one boycotting is in a position of weakness, therefore the harms of boycotting will be more than any benefit. If this is known, then Islamic boycotting is an action of obedience ordered by Allah. Look at this. And his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Any act of obedience must be done sincerely for the sake of Allah. Didn't we say this in the first start? Ikhlas wa mutaba. Uh, must be done sincerely for the sake of Allah and also conform to His order. If boycotting is done, meaning hajjah, is done sincerely for the sake of Allah, then it is correct. Whoever boycotts another person due to his personal desire or the boycott is not in conformity to that which has been legislated, then this type of boycotting is not correct. How often do people do something due to their own personal desires, thinking at the same time that it is being done out of obedience to Allah? Allahu Akbar. That's a statement of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, uh, rahimahullah ta'ala. Immense, immense uh, benefit. And then the Shaykh, Shaykh Abdul Masin said, the people of knowledge have mentioned that if a scholar makes a mistake, it is not correct to follow up the scholar in that mistake. Neither is it correct to disassociate from him due to that error. Rather, his mistake will be expiated and forgiven due to his many good deeds. Uh, we'll stop there. And there's so many lessons in that. And I hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes this a beneficial, uh, uh, beneficial study in that if one person or two people benefit from this and they practice this 
and benefit in their lives, then Alhamdulillah, this is a khair from Allah Azza wa Jal and a reminder because we are in need of distinguishing the fitna. We are in need of coming back to Allah Azza wa Jal and removing ourselves from the harms. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us with ikhlas, with the bad al-sunnah. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.